little dinosaurs. Look at all those chickens. The meetup game is today, and there is an astonishing 38 people on the list. Sort of crazy. I am stoked, but I am in danger of being my usual late self. Really want to get there on time. So I'm going to have to run, and we are going to get going. So we're going to shower, shave, not in that order, and uh, get going. Let's do it. Oh yeah, we're ready for a mug. Oh, I have a yeah, I have a yeah, yeah. You didn't like that one, huh? Yeah. Gips, because there's so many here that and you really don't like Welcome to this vlog. We are going to talk about the October meetup game at Maryland Live. This one was exciting for me. I was pretty pumped to run not only a bigger game in 3-5 no limit, larger than the 1-3 that we typically play, but to also invite a guest to come over. So Dan Zach graciously agreed to come in, hang out with us, play approximately... 100x 50x lower stakes than he normally would and uh, sort of slum it in the streets with us at 3-5 so this game was a long time coming i think as far as jumping it up to a five dollar big blind level wasn't sure what to expect if we'd even you know get more than one table i wasn't really sure kind of who all would show up but you guys blew me away with a 38 person call-in list so thank you guys to those who called in and didn't show up though you're dead to me. Just kidding, but uh, in all seriousness, I do think we might shift back to kind of like the Facebook event RSVP system. I feel like people sort of felt more committed to showing up and supporting it that way than just calling in uh, to a list the way they normally would. The other thing that wasn't really in our favor was that it was raining pretty hard that day, and I do kind of feel like it impacted it. Like I think some people just sort of didn't show uh, because of the weather. So, you know, stuff happens. I, I can totally appreciate the guys who called in and just couldn't make it. But uh, massive love to everybody who showed up, showed support. Can't say how much I appreciate you all for being there. Let's get into these hands. So in this first hand, I am sitting on $900. I'm in for 1K. So, you know, probably opened and got three bet by Dan Zach a few times and folded like a little. $900 in the stack. I'm on the button here with ace queen offsuit and I decide to open it up to 20 bucks. The big blind is the only caller, so we go heads up to a flop of king, king, five. He checks and I think this hand has enough showdown value to just check behind and see what comes on the turn, so that's what I do. The turn is also a pretty great card. It's the ace of spades. So it gives us top pair, does put three to a flush out there, but I think that's okay because no bets went in on the flop, he shouldn't have you know, a particularly high percentage of flush draws. So when he checks, I go ahead and bet 20 this time. He makes the call, so we go heads up to a river card, which is a brick, the four of clubs. He checks again, and I think we have a pretty clear value bet once again. The fact that he didn't lead the turn, the fact that he didn't check raise the turn, don't think he has a king too often. We beat every other ace, so pretty clear value bet here. We may even get called by, you know, pocket pairs below the king. So I put on a bet of 75, I do get called, and my hand is good. So pretty simple one there. Nice to be off to a somewhat winning start. Well, maybe a break-even start, because again, I fold a lot to Dan Zach. In this next hand, we've got 1K in front of us. 
The button makes it $20. I call in the big blind with ace-10 offsuit. The flop comes out, ace-ace-3, rainbow. I check, he bets 15, and I don't think I would have probably any bluffs here to check raise with, so I don't want to check raise this hand for value. Go ahead and call. Turn is a 9, and it goes check, check. The river is a six, and I think we have to value it now. He can have plenty of pocket pairs. He can have a very weak ace sometimes that he may just check back the turn for pot control with. So I go ahead and bet 35, and he surprisingly makes it 140. And I guess I don't be value for <laughs> How big of a nit am I, though? <laughs> So right away, I have alarm bells going off in my head. I, I It's hard to really put any hands we beat into his range. Uh, hands that make a lot of sense from a value perspective would be ace nine, uh, pocket nines, maybe pocket sixes where he just rivered a boat. But ultimately, nothing else really makes a ton of sense for value. And it's really hard when you're in a spot like this and it's so hard to put him on value. But at the same time, there's not really any logical bluffs that I could come up with. It would just have to be a pure random bluff. But we do probably have one of the best hands I could possibly hold here. Uh, it's certainly the best ace I would likely have in this configuration because I probably three bet the better ones pre. So I just, I just kind of put in the side call, not really expecting to win all that often, if ever. And uh, unsurprisingly, I end up losing two pocket nines. So, so much for that good start. In this next hand, we are sitting on $800, seven-handed, and I raise king-10 of hearts to $20 from under the gun. It is seven-handed, so this isn't really super, you know, condemnable, I would say, but definitely not a mandatory open either. The hijack, the cutoff, and the big blind all call, and the flop comes out six, six, deuce, rainbow. Checks round. I definitely think we could put out C-bets here, but I don't think it's super mandatory, especially when we don't have a backdoor flush draw. The turn is a 10 of clubs, so we make top pair. Uh, good buddy of mine, Tesh, ends up leading for 30 bucks, and I just make the call. The river is the six off suit, and he checks. I don't think he's gonna be mega strong here almost ever, but I think we're basically always good, so we definitely wanna be betting, just not a particularly large size. So I go for a size of $45, he does make the call, and my hand is good. Call. I know I fucked me. Oh. I thought we were gonna get a high hand. In this next hand, I'm sitting on about $850, and there's a straddle to 10 in this hand. I am in middle position with King Queen offsuit, and I bump it up to $40. The straddle is the only caller, and we go heads up to a flop of five deuce deuce rainbow. He checks, I see about $25, and he makes the call. The turn is the queen of diamonds, and he checks once again. I bet 85, now that we've made this pair, should really be good most of the time. He can have some deuces, but it's usually gonna be pocket pairs and ace highs that get to this turn. So when I bet 85, he makes the call, and the river jack brings in a backdoor flush draw, and he checks once again. I think it's potentially slightly thin to bet. Uh, it's a little hard to see what we get called by. Um, he can probably have ace queen here and he could probably have queen jack as well. Um, he can have some deuces, but I do think those would probably check raise turn most of the time. So really, I think we're targeting things like uh, worse queens, something like a queen 10 suited, but he'd have to even float the flop with that, which is very debatable and pocket pairs smaller than a jack. So ultimately, I think I should be betting, but I should be betting a lot smaller. So I think I make a pretty sizable mistake by betting 180. I think it's just too hard for him to really call with worse. He also gives us some more bad news by check raising to $525. Just have fives, I guess. I don't block anything good. Uh, now, it seems like most of the time we just can't be good here. Um, I definitely think the meetup games are full of some more shenanigans than most other games. But when somebody goes check call, check call, check raise to over 100 big blinds, 
it's just pretty likely they've got it. Now, I wasn't sure if he pretty much just had flushes or if he could have some you know, boats, quads would make sense. It seemed a little thin to me that he would do it with trips, but I still don't think there's enough bluffs. I don't think there's maybe any bluffs and there's plenty of value hands he could do this with. So I fold it and he shows us a pretty surprising hand in Queen Jack. I, mean, I don't know how you don't have it. That's <laughs> one way to have it. I don't know if that counts as having it, but... Was that the best hand? No. It, it was. Oh, wow. But okay. barely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's pretty thin on his part. I don't think I can really call with worse, since I would probably just be folding aces here, and every other hand in my range um, would have him beat. I also actually get to this spot with a lot of double-barreled diamond draws that then get there on the river and are definitely not folding. So kind of a kind of a weird like uh, you know value bluff there where he just kind of ends up probably making me fold all better hands. But I kind of get it when you float the queen high, turn a pair, and river two pair uh, that that you might do that. What's kind of funny is that he'd actually be getting me to fold some better hands because aces beats queen jack now. So that was a, a little bit of a horrifying thing to see, but so I'm glad I had king, queen, and not, not aces. So onto this next hand, I've uh, rebought for 300 since I, I lost quite a chunk in that hand. $700 in the stack now, and the hijack limps in. I'm in the cutoff with pocket nines, and I bump it up to $25. Dan Zak is in the big blind, and as he has been wont to do, he three bets me to 95 Folds around to me and can't be folding a hand this good to a player this competent. He's going to have enough bluffs here and maybe even some worse value hands. So I go ahead and make the call. Flop comes out, queen eight for rainbow. He goes ahead and C bets. I think it was around $75 and I make the call. Definitely can't go anywhere yet. The turn is a 10 and he bets 150 now. This is the point where I think we should probably just be folding dude hey can you hear me okay sorry i was uh in the middle of recording so my phone's like in a super awkward spot um uh just for the vlog the turn is an offsuit 10 and dan now bets 150 i definitely think that even though we pick up a gutter this is kind of the turning point in the hand I think that folding is super reasonable. Um, his range is going to be pretty strong. I think he will retain ace king though. So I was kind of loath to fold. But at the same time, if he has ace king and then we hit a straight, you know, we just get stacked. So there are, there are some reverse implied odds involved here. Um, an ace or a king is a bad card. Uh, there are potentially a few other bad cards. So it's just sort of one of those spots where I think it's going to be hard to call on a river. So the turn often, I think, becomes sort of the decision point in the hand. I do decide to call, though, and we go heads up to a river card, which is the beautiful Jack offsuit. So <laughs> we just make it, and when he checks, the stack sizes just dictate that we sort of have to jam here. I shove and it's about $400 effective, so I don't think a smaller size makes a ton of sense. Dan does tank and he ultimately does fold, so we miss the uh, full full double there, but pretty nice spot for us to pick up. In this next hand, under the gun limps in, the cutoff limps, and I'm in the small one with Queen Jack and I bump it up to 25. Under the gun is a player who's not really here for the meetup game, he just kind of ended up at the table. so. He's somewhat weaker than the average at this table, and I felt like I sort of understand pretty well what he was doing and how I could exploit him. So when he makes the call and we go heads up, I was pretty happy to go to the flop. Comes out king, jack, four, and I decided to check. Don't think we're going to get a ton of value from worse. He checks it back. The turn is the ace of diamonds, and I check once again. He now bets 40, and... I'm not expecting this to be a slam dunk spot. I think that folding would be perfectly reasonable, but I decided to call because we have some outs and because I might be able to do some shenanigan type stuff on the river, depending on what comes. The river ends up coming, the eight of spades, bringing the 
front door flush draw. I check, and he now bets 65. His sizing to me is very indicative of a one pair hand for the most part, and a hand that probably can't stand a lot of heat. Now, normally against a lot of players, I wouldn't even consider check raising here because when I don't see bet the flop, they're not going to put me on a lot of flush draws. Uh, they're not going to put me on a lot of the just strong flopped or turned hands. So typically that wouldn't be something I'd be considering when I'm taking this line. But against this player, I think he's aware enough to sort of read the board, see there's a flush draw out there, see that a lot of straights and two pairs are possible, but not really understand how likely it is for me to have those hands. So I think I can just kind of take this hand and turn it into a not particularly good bluff. Like, I don't think I would normally do this, but against this exact opponent, I did decide to raise. So I make it 215. He pretty much just snap folds, and we get to take one down here that we kind of had no business winning. At this next hand, $1,100 in the stack, and the button limps in. I'm in the small blind with ace-jack offsuit, and I bump it up to $25. The button calls, so we go heads up to a flop of ace-queen-5. I see bet 25, and he makes the call. The turn is the four of clubs, and he's got about 250 here, so I'm already sort of thinking about setting up maybe a turn in river jam situation. So I bet 70, leaving him 180 behind, and he makes the call once again. The river is the seven of spades, and again, with 180 behind, it's not my favorite spot in the world. There are two pairs available to him, but there's just not really much else out there. The board's pretty wet, so I expect a flopped or a turned two pair to most likely just get it in earlier. Uh, same with sets. So I do go for the jam of 180. He thinks for a little while and calls. For maybe like four months. With ace seven. So pretty unfortunate. Uh, shout out to Daryl P. Miller here. Uh, he was following the Twitch page for a long time while that was going on. And uh, <laughs> he gets one over on us here with the three outer. Really feels like I've been running kind of bad with the turn and river cards. They've just kind of been bringing in the, the runouts to make me lose the maximum. But that's just kind of the game we're playing sometimes. Got to move on to the next hand. In this next one, $700 in the stack. The hijack makes it 20 and I'm in the small blind with ace-queen of diamonds. I bump it up to $70. Hijack makes a call, so we go heads up to a flop in this three-bet pot. Jack, nine, deuce. I go ahead and see bet $60, and he makes the call. Turn is the six of diamonds, and I just kind of decide at this point that I am probably going to take this hand to the felt if it comes out, you know, bricks. I don't have a particularly good hand to do this with, but I've been so in line. I've been showing a bunch of hands that uh, connected pretty hard, and even though I've been losing, I haven't really gotten caught with any bluffs or anything like that like that river check raise bluff i didn't show um so i decide kind of early in this hand that i'm likely going for broke unless the river is something pretty bad to continue on such as one that pairs the board or probably a third heart i wouldn't go on either so i bet 165 and he makes the call the river is the three of diamonds and with about 400 behind I go ahead, stick with the plan, and I jam it all in. He doesn't think that long and folds. And this time, we show. Um, I think that's right, yeah. yeah. Wait a Woo. barrel, Maddie. Woo. Wait a barrel, oh, Maddie. Oh, no. <laughs> no, it's like, look at Maddie barrel. Woo! Because it's the meetup game. Sitting on $1,000 now, and there's a bomb pot for $15 each, eight-handed. The flop comes out, ace, seven, five, with no flush draws available, and I'm sitting on the button spot. Checks to the cutoff, who bets $75. I look down at seven, five, offsuit, and this is a hand that I think is actually pretty interesting. We could raise for sure. We could just call. With so many players behind, I think that raising probably makes sense at a pretty high frequency, but given that nobody led, um, I think that just calling is probably also okay. We don't need a ton of protection when everybody's checked through already. So I just I just make the call, 
And surprisingly, the small blind and middle position both call as well. So this pot is actually quickly ballooning. The turn is the Jack of Diamonds, and it checks the cutoff, who now down bets from the previous street to $50. He only has about $250 to start this street. So, you know, when that's the case, it's a pretty weird spot. Um, the small blind has 300 in front of him, and middle position has me covered. So I think a raise is definitely in order. I decided to bump it up to 250 and somehow everybody tanks before folding. So it ends up getting shown, or maybe I just tell people what I had. Turns out small blind had 7-5 as well, and middle position, I think, just had an ace. Not really sure what the cutoff had, but pretty interesting spot. Goes to show you how bomb pots can really uh, kind of create situations where nobody really knows exactly what's going on or what to do. And I think that's a pretty cool element of them, really bringing a an, an portion of the game forward that most people haven't studied. And it kind of just becomes a little bit more gambly, a little more fun as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I really hope to see them picking up more in just kind of regular day-to-day -day games, not just in, you know, meetup games and home games. Really wish that Maryland Live would let us bring bomb pots into a double board situation, but unfortunately they have said no. Aside from that though, Maryland Live was an awesome host as always. Uh, you know, they managed this list really well for the Collins. Uh, we had our own little section in the back of the room for everybody. And as usual, they had up the sign for us to film. So I did get some you know, whole card footage and some footage of the table that typically I would not normally be able to get. So shout out to Maryland Live, to the dealers, to the floor staff, and especially to Jason Heidenthal for helping me set up and manage these games. Remember, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, it really helps out with the algorithm and spreading this channel. You could also share this video with a friend, comment down below letting me know what you thought, and I'll see you guys all next time. Peace.